Well, hey, everybody, good morning. Uh, wanted to thank my guest, uh, Steve Sims, for being here today. Uh, the reason I had Steve on, I am really am so excited to have him on, is because the number one question that I always get when people come to the company or call me or ask about Simply Vegas, because we do sell a lot of high-end real estate, is how do I sell more high-end real estate? And as agents, we are always prone to go to these conventions or go to these seminars or talks that people have where they stroll out the high-end you know, agents in that marketplace across the stage and you know, agents sit in the crowd and ask them questions. And, and my firm belief is they tell you just enough uh, to get you dangerous, but they're not going to tell you everything. And the reason they're not going to tell you everything is because at the end of the day, you are their competitor. So uh, what I, when, I, when I started thinking about this, uh, Steve is a guy that I've known for about eight years. Um, and I followed him uh, religiously. I'll tell you a little bit about how I met him, and then we'll, we'll get more to him. But about eight years, uh, seven years ago, I guess it was, I bought a car. I bought a Jaguar and uh, an XJ. And in the in my XJ like welcome package, I had this little card that said, "You get this complimentary membership to the Bluefish." And I was like, "What is the Bluefish?" And my phone rang about maybe five days later. And it was Steve on the other end. And Steve tells me that I has this company. It's a, it's, I'll let him tell you a little bit more what it is. But the reality of it is, is I like the pitch so much. I'm that guy because I am a sales junkie. I mean, I, I do everything I can to try to perpetuate myself and make my uh, sword sharper, if you will. So if somebody calls me with a good pitch or I like the technique or I like the approach, man, I, I dive in. And Steve was so good with me on the phone. At building rapport that very first time that we ever spoke and he was so it was so crafted and so well done and so natural and so free-flowing i started kind of following him i mean he didn't really realize i was doing it but you know we would talk from time to time when he would have events that were coming up or trying to see if there was anything that i needed but more what i started doing was finding these uh, i found steve on a television interview from australia i think it was and, and, and little things and anything i find and articles and forth anything i could find where steve was quoted on how he runs his business and his philosophy i started reading and I started incorporating not just what I was reading into the things that I was doing, but also teaching some of these techniques. We talked about this the other day. Uh, I want you to talk about the SkyMall thing in a minute because you can't do SkyMall anymore because it'll make it. But I love that. And um, I'm so happy to have him here because I know he's going to be very free-flowing with information and really outgoing with how he connects so well with extremely high net worth individuals. So welcome, Steve. Let's start out with tell me a little bit about your history, man. Tell me, tell me about you and how this got started. Hello, <laughs> it's Percy, I should say. Um, East London bricklayer, uh, came from a construction family, worked on the door, worked on building sites. Um, now, 20 plus years later, um, we, we've we been quoted as Forbes by the real life Wizard of Oz. Um, we, wanna, uh, we had a client wanted to get married in the Vatican by the Pope. We took over the academia and set up a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David. And had Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade them. Um, we've had guitar lessons uh, given to clients by ZZ Top. We've had drum lessons by uh, Guns N' Roses. Um, we work with uh, Elton John for the Oscar. Uh, we support that every year for his Oscar party with Steven Tyler and all those people. We are the people that you don't really know that give the high society their interesting cocktail stories. <laughs> Now, this all started. Now, this is a made-up job, is what you like to say, I know. You made this job up, right? I did, yeah. So this wasn't like a uh, you went to, went to a college and it was one of the electives you could choose and, and go. So how did, how did you come to craft this? For, I know it was Hong Kong is where this started, correct? Yeah, so I managed – I talked my way into a job when I was in London to have them send me over to Hong Kong, believe it or not, as a stockbroker. And well, they fell for it. They you qualified were, for that at all, not qualified at all for this. No, no, oh God, no, I was a bricklayer. <laughs> I literally turned up at this bank to see my buddy, and they were doing a seminar on brokers going there. I went into the seminar because they had a breakfast buffet, and I was just eating. I, I, I challenged myself if I could consume the entire breakfast buffet. And during this, I heard about these brokers going to Hong Kong, and I just went up to the lady at the back. I had nothing to lose, and I went, have you got my name in there? And she went, no. And I was like, oh, my God. And so she wrote my name down, and I got a ticket to Hong Kong as a stockbroker. And <laughs> I arrived on the Saturday, and I was fired on the Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so the shortest finance career in history, I'm thinking. That and, and, and a narrow narrow miss of a bullet, I think. If I'd have, <laughs> if I'd have managed to get through it, then uh, it could have been devastating. But I ended up working on the door of a nightclub, uh, started putting on events, and 
it was very simple. I am very simple. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to bring people in, they've got to be A, cool. I'm a great believer that my gut is far smarter than my head. So they've got to be cool. I've got to be able to resonate with them. And they've got to be able to afford me. Two factors. That's all I cared about. You know, if you were cool and you could afford me, I'll have a beer with you. But if I'm going to go into business, then you've got to be able to afford me. Um, and so I would invite rich people and I would network to find out who's coming to town, who's now got a new job, who's got a new promotion, who's got married. And I would communicate with them and go, hey, congratulations. Well done. Great to be here. By the way, I'm throwing a party next week. It's only 500 bucks. But I'd love to see you there. This is the location and this is the password. And I started doing that and found that a lot of people liked to go to those kind of environments. Now, I did it with the delusion that if I knew enough rich people, they would give me a job. So <laughs> I was setting up these incredible events and they started off in, in dingy little clubs ended up being in penthouses and mega yachts. And so they really went to the extreme. But I always thought that they were, I expected, and this was the dumb thing, I expected one of them to come up to me one day and go, Steve, you're so good at whatever it is you're doing. We'd like to employ you for a gross amount of money. And, of course, it never happened. And it's the only time in my life I never actually asked for, for that job. I never asked. I spent so much time doing and assisting and providing. Before I knew it, I had a network of people that needed and used me for these things. Now, I think that I think that's interesting because one of the things that we always talk about, or you always hear in sales or real estate, is you know, fake it till you make it, and you know, try. You have to have the expensive car, and you have to wear the custom suits if you want to fit in. Now, I know that you're actually talking to us from your garage full of motorcycles because that's who you are. And yeah. I also know that there's one photograph of you that you don't like uh, that's out there. So my question is, because uh, that photograph was taken, back then when you were doing this in, in, in Hong Kong, were you to a certain extent faking it until you made it, or were you always authentically true to yourself? All right, for a start, let's never use the word authentic. It's become okay. the bloody mouse pad <laughs> of the year. I'm a great believer in transparency. Okay. okay? I want you to understand me quickly. I want to be impossible to misunderstand. Coming from a bricklaying background and a construction field and not having a lot of money when I was young, I was ignorant to what I could have. So when I was in Hong Kong, I didn't know what a Patek Philip was. I didn't know what an Odomar PJ was. I didn't know these things. I was like the four-year-old, and I often refer to myself as a 51-year-old a fifty-one-year-old uh, four-year-old. I often say that. Um because someone would turn up with a nice watch, and I'd be like, oh, what's that? And they'd be like, oh, it's, it's an Omar Piché Royal Oak. And I'd be like, oh, that's good. can you tell me about it? And I would be eager. I wouldn't be uh, intimidated. I wouldn't be kind of like, oh, it's a pleasure. Hey, a nice watch. You know, I, I, that's lovely. You know, why did you buy that? Are there other watches that you would have bought? And I would be always very inquisitive. So I never faked it. The picture that you're talking about, you heartless person, for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> when I did, and it devastated my life, and I've tried to keep it there as a, as a rock to remind me of that. But I never faked it when I was in Hong Kong because I wasn't intelligent enough um, to be able to fake it. And I think that was part of my secret source because I would – and I've always been on motorcycles. In fact, the picture you're talking about is the only time I physically ever purchased a car. Um, I, I, you know, I was born on motorcycles. Um, and I hope I will die on motorcycles. Not soon, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, but there was a period that as I started getting more successful, um, like all entrepreneurs and all successful people, you start doubting yourself. And you start questioning, how can I make this better? How can I make it brilliant? And like all entrepreneurs, we actually screw it up. You know, it seems that we, in, we, we intentionally do it. Entrepreneurs are built that as soon as it starts becoming stable, we find a way to screw it up because we go in a different tangent or do something with it. I actually believe that you wouldn't take me seriously, even though I've been in business for you know six years, pulling up on motorcycles, you know, sticking my helmet on the bar while talking to a client, getting his black card. Um, I felt intimidated 
by working in Monaco that these people wouldn't take me seriously if I didn't turn up in a suit. I started to have uh, suits made for me. And by now I was living in Geneva, Switzerland, and I would turn up. And because I was doing work with Ferrari, I bought a 1972 Ferrari Dino. Okay. Beautiful car. Still love it today. Don't like what it represented of me at that time. <laughs> But the story that you're talking about was I had this party, three-story mega yacht, loads of people, richest people in the planet. We had um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was on there during his Terminator period. So, you know, we had you know big princes, pre um, uh, queens, kings, all the most elite people on this yacht. And I remember coming off this yacht and I had a suit on and I felt a little bit kind of like, you know, stiff and oh my god so and i tried to be a lot more pronounced in as i was speaking because everyone was fancying the hell out of hugh grant at the time and i was the polar opposite um and there was there was my ferrari at the bottom of the boat and i said to my wife can you take a picture of me you know you know because I'm, I'm the shit you know i'm the boy you know i got a suit and i got a ferrari next to us was a sail yacht and it was bigger wasn't taller <laughs> but it was bigger so I went, oh, hang on a minute. So I reversed the, my car up and then leaned against it, Miami Vice style, and got a photograph. Now, this was back in the 90s. So this was the period where you got your roll of film, stuck it in an envelope, and about three years later, you got it back with all your photographs in it. And I remember being at my desk, going through these photographs and uh, with all these famous people, and I was with Prince Albert. There's a picture of me with him, and going through it, and that picture showed up. And what bothered me about that picture was that I wasn't in it. Not only had I gone to somebody else's boat because my three-story yacht wasn't, in my eyes, big enough. I was in a suit that didn't work. And I was on a car. I didn't really know much about the car. And I realized that I wasn't in that photograph. I realized that I had sacrificed who I was to get people that therefore couldn't resonate with me because they didn't know me. So I was losing friends. I was making money. I was gaining clients who I had no connection with whatsoever. So we literally decided to kill that, uh, that person from the picture. And there was an event in Switzerland, which I'd gone to every month. And I said to my wife, I'm going to go there. And I said to myself, maybe the social dynamic of these parties has changed. So maybe it's not me. Maybe something's happening and I need to get a grasp of it again. So if anyone's ever done golf, karate, any of these things, they always tell you go back to basics. So I literally got back on my bike um, and rode down to this party, walked in, you know, bike jacket, crash helmet in my hand, got to the end of the bar, sat down. And there was this guy that I wasn't friendly with. I wasn't a friend of mine, but. I knew him every month, you know, this event. And I've been going, I'd never missed a month of this party, okay? He walked up to me and he turned around. He's like, Steve, I haven't seen you here for months. And in that split second, I realized that's because I hadn't actually been there. This person who I was pretending to be had, and it was so clear that he made that comment that it struck me hard. I think I started to tear up at the end of the bar, which is not a good sight. Um, and I decided at that time, the car went up for sale the following day from that party. Um, I like wearing a nice suit, but I was going to wear the suit and the suit wasn't going to wear me. And I went back to the jeans and T-shirt. And everywhere I go, I've turned up to Elton's. I've turned up to Prince's. I've turned up to royalty on a bike. I've traveled. When I travel to other countries, I don't rent a car. I rent a bike. And I will pull up to my appointment on a bike. Do you think that... Let me ask you this. Do you think that your clients find you more interested in them or they're more interested by you? Which do you think it is? Uh, I think I'm easy to understand and impossible to misunderstand. So I don't think I'm a challenge. A lot of the people that I deal with and a lot of the people that are your clients, they're constantly badgered because they know that they've got something that most people want. And most of the time, that's money. OK, so you're you're sucking up to them, laughing at their bad jokes to try and get that money, to try and get them to commit with me. I'm so transparent. That if they tell a bad joke, I'm like, please make the next one better. You know, I'm I'm very easy to converse with. 
And I think a lot of people have said to me before, which has been kind of strange, that I'm very relaxing to converse with. Because I'm not challenging to go, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got that watch as well. Oh, yeah, I've got – you know, there's none of that. I haven't, I haven't got a watch on, you know. Um, but it's just I'm very easy to, to, to work with. And I think the key word is to be uh, more interested than interesting. Um, and so I'm very passionate about, okay, you've got me here. Why am I here? Why did you reach out to me? You need me for something. You know, I need your checkbook, but you need me for something. So what is it? What can we discuss? And I make it very clear and simple. And when it's that simple, you can't help but resonate. And if it doesn't resonate, walk away from it. Well, that's a, that's an interesting thing, too, because most of your, all of your clients now are referral-based. It's pretty much, I, I think, 100%. Oh, yeah, business. we've never had a telephone number on no. our website. You've never been able to contact us without buying membership. And membership's five grand a year. And for that, you get our phone number. Yeah, pretty much. So my my point is though, how do you get like say I say I'm I'm a new person trying to break in, not to what you do, but into that high net worth clientele. How do you get over that hump of that first client, and how do you make that client your cheerleader? I know that you say uh, in your book at one point. I don't want to give too much of it away because I want people to buy it. But I know you talk about one one solid recommendation from one person is worth more than twenty thousand postcards. Um, so how do you how do you hit that first? How do you hit that first client and that first relationship and how do you nurture that and work that person to help you get uh, those referrals come, come out? Well, we're doing, we're doing the same thing. You know, we're in the same industry. We're providing something to people that can afford it. That's as simple as it is, whether it be a car, a jewelry, a concierge services or, or a phenomenal penthouse or property. We're doing the same thing. We're providing something to people that can afford us. And therefore, quite simply, first of all, you've got to realize they need us. You know, mm. you can't force someone to buy something they don't want. Okay. Maybe you can if it's 10 bucks, but not when it's 10 million bucks. So they need something. So they need to, they need to first of all feel that you're the person that can. That person needs to be the only client that you have. The only person you've ever had. Every time I discuss anything with a client, they are my pinpoint focus, my laser attention. And I want to find something out of them which is completely abstract to why they've got me there. Now, you mentioned earlier about a lot of people get up on stage and talk about a certain amount because they don't want to give the game away. Sure. I want to give the game away. I want to pull the curtain down because if you're better at doing what you're doing, it makes people communicate better, and that's the world I want to be in. So I'm not holding any secrets back. You can ask any question you want, and I'm going to answer it. So when you're speaking to a client and they come to you because they want to spend a million dollars on something, let's pick a property, okay? They're looking in a certain area. When you're communicating with them, I'm not talking about tweeting or, you know, texting. I'm on about chatting. I'm on about conversing. I'm on about sitting down face-to-face -face or over Skype. Make a note of what they like. You know, if I'm going to say, we're chatting, and I notice you've got your kids in the background, okay? So make a note of the person. Make a note of what they're talking about. Maybe ask them about a struggle. Oh, how did you get over here? Oh, do you like traveling a lot? Oh, I don't really like traveling. Oh, so where do you travel to? Find out something which is abstract to the point of the conversation, and then after the conversation, a couple of days later, send something to them. Now, it could be a link of an article on how to travel better. It could be a link. Like, for argument's sake, I'm going to send you a link, but I won't. I will tell you what I'm going to do. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you've got, you've got pictures of your kids in the background. Okay. And you've got an Apple headset on. I do. Now, so... You know, we're suspecting you're probably working off of some kind of Mac. Either you've got a Mac, the uh, program you're using now, I'm or you've got I'm, okay. I'm looking at a Mac and I have an iPhone. Both. Right. Bingo. All right. So I found a company the other day, and I'm always trying to find something that's quirky and different. There's a company that makes Bluetooth wireless speakers in the picture of whatever picture you want. Okay. So you can actually send them a picture of your, your, your children, okay? Uh -huh. And they will send you back the exact same as what you've got behind you. But behind the canvas is actually a flat technology speaker system. And it's oh, a wow. good speaker system. Their prices start at $169. Totally okay? affordable? Yeah. 
Totally affordable. Totally affordable. Totally affordable. Totally. You, you buy a bulk of them and you get them even cheaper. Okay. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you can find a really good good picture, send it to these people. They will send you a um, this speaker directly to you. Now you've got something that you can listen to really good music from a picture. Now I can send that of your kids. I can find out what passion you've got. Maybe it's a Ferrari. Maybe you'll make a note in your Facebook page that, oh, my God, I really want this yacht. I take a picture of the yacht. I send them a picture of the yacht, and I go, there you go. You're now listening to your vision board, okay? Mm -hmm. Those kind of things. Now, I will tell you, that's expensive to what I usually do. Mm -hmm. I will speak to someone, and then I will actually subscribe to a magazine for them, mm -hmm. okay? So every quarter, they get a magazine, and they go, oh, that was from Steve. It's amazing how many times each quarter I get texts and phone calls, and I'm literally thinking to myself on my fake watch, I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> magazines have dropped, okay? But I went to a party, and this is probably a good one in your circle. I went to a party up in Ohio. I'm here in Hollywood at the moment, and the guy was a collector of wine, exotic uh, uh, cars, and horses, okay? Now, he had this party to show off his new house. So he had friends, vendors, partners, you know, business associates. Anyone was trying to get into this party because the guy was well-known to be rich, and this was his night where he was going to show it off, all right? So I get, I get there, get off my motorbike, and two guys get out of an Uber. And I recognize these guys because they've tried selling me jet charter services for my clients before, and we haven't bit. In their hand is a box of wine. Okay. Now, they've obviously done that research. The guy likes wine. The guy likes horses. The guy likes cars. Therefore, the cheapest one to purchase is wine. <laughs> okay? Do you know much about wine? Uh, do I know much about it? Yeah. What my wife tells me, what you, what you tell me. Right. Would you dare take, take a box of you think is a, <laughs> I I know that this is a ballsy risk? For me, for me, if it's wine in a box, that's all I know. You know, it, I had no idea. But this guy was trying to show off with this wine. So I knew it couldn't be cheap. And I think by the looks of it, there were three bottles in there. It looked like one of those wooden boxes with a little uh, um, uh, bit of rope on it. And I walked in, and they were trying to make this big show of, oh, we've got you this wine. He's got loads of people coming in. Intelligence should have told them that he's not going to have the time to go all girly fight and glitzy over this wine. So he, they walk in. I was behind them. I was having a real giggle at this because I like to analyze how people work. Mm -hmm. They hand over the wine, expecting there to be like a drum roll, and all of a sudden the confetti come out. And the guy goes, oh, thanks, puts the wine behind him. Step inside, have some drink, enjoy the party. You know, dead. Nothing, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so I walk in. Hey, how are you? thanks for bringing me along. I really appreciate it. I don't know how long I'm going to stay, but, you know, it looks a cool place. I'll, I'll mooch around. So I go off. As the night's going on and he's going around, these guys can't recreate the giving of the gift unless they run up to the front door, pick it up, and then try and do it again. Um, but I turned around and I said, look, I know you like wine, horses, fancy cars. I don't know anything about any of those things. But I do know when my wife asks me to open up a bottle of wine, that annoying bastard piece of foil on the top, I often cut my fingers on. And I pulled out of my pocket a little foil remover. I went, I bought you this. It may save your fingers. And I gave <laughs> it to him. And it cost me 20 bucks. Okay? <laughs> and he was like, Oh, thank you. It was a detail, a consideration. Now, later on that evening, he stands caught. He stands up on this slight raised platform. He's got a desk, and he wants to serve some of his favorite wines to his friends. Every bottle of wine he was undoing was my little cork thing. <laughs> and I thought to myself, he's using something I gave him. So I've also – I know some guy uh, loves shoes from Italy. I bought him a bone – shoehorn because the metal ones you can't take through um uh baggage claim anymore you can't take through uh tsa because it's metal okay uh, you buy them a bone one you can take it through so i try to keep thoughtful gifts under 35 bucks if you know someone's traveling a travel plug if you know they're going somewhere maybe an easy course on the best food or how to cook italian something cheap and cheerful that just shows them you actually paid attention to that conversation mm -hmm.
I, well, I think I think that brings me to my next thing I want to talk about, which is just communication. I, I know that you're a big proponent of video as I am, and uh, obviously we've seen why that today. I mean, you, you picked up just on watching this that I'm running Apple earphones and the kids and everything else. It's amazing what you can pick up when you get face to face. So, uh, you know, explain. Talk a little bit about your philosophy about communication, uh, just from there. Well, you've already said it, you know, we're having a chat here. We could have this conversation over the phone and I would be able to pick up on your tone, but I wouldn't be able to pick up on where you're sitting. I wouldn't be able to pick up on the Apple. I wouldn't be able to pick up on the kids. I wouldn't be able to pick up on any of those things. Okay. But everyone's got these smartphones. What I tend to do, and I do it a lot of the time in here is I will record a video and I'll go, yeah, hey, John, I just wanted to say, I know we haven't talked for a little while, but I want to reach out to you next Tuesday. Is that okay? And you push send and you send it via text, okay? Now, here's a couple of, here's a little quiz for your folks out there, okay, if they want to play. How many fingers does it take to delete an email? It takes one. How many fingers does it take to open up an envelope? Like five. <laughs> you, you can open an envelope, envelope with one yeah. hand. Well, so, no, 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 hold it and then use the right. thing. So you have to buy fingers of one thing, I guess. You've got, okay, perfect. So you <laughs> are engaged. If someone gives you a letter, and you can try it, give someone a letter and then say, oh, check your emails. And they're like trying to check their emails without elbows. They can't do it. So I try to do stuff which gets people as engaged as possible to stop them looking at the other stuff. So I would do a video text because we all know we wake up in the morning, we're pouring the coffee, you look at the phone, you see you've got 200 emails, you've got five or 10 texts or maybe two. What do you answer first? From the text or the emails? Oh, the text for sure. The text. What if one of those texts has done a push notification and is now it's got my smiley face going, you yeah. know, on your text, you're now like, Oh, what's he up to? So you push yeah. it on, then you play it. And from that text video, you're now getting all of this. Oh, he's in the background. He's got he's got bikes. He's got his black T-shirt on. He's very enthusiastic or he's very down. You get far more communication out of visual than you do out of simple text. And you need to understand this. This is very important. When you send a text message, tech, and when I say text, I mean copy, in text, in tweet, in Instagram, in Facebook Messenger, in email, understood that the recipient has the ability to read it in the worst possible way. Now, if I turn around and go, John, beer tonight, 7 o'clock, I'm here smiling with you. You're thinking, yeah, that sounds a good idea. But if I send it on a text and you've just lost the biggest deal, or worse, worse still, you've just found out your accountant has run off with all that money, that text is going to come through sounding demanding. So you've got to be careful. Thank you. My wife just brought me coffee. Uh, <laughs> so I, I really believe that whatever you write should be real short. Brevity is king. And you should communicate on the understanding that whatever you're sending, people will read it in a negative way. And if you look at it that cynically, you'll be better at writing the copy. But you don't have to worry about the copy if you video it. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. So I have, I have a question. So we talked earlier, something else, another concept in your book that I really like is the chug test uh, concept. Now, in the real estate business that we're in, a lot of our clients, we deal with them maybe every four or five years as far as actually having a transaction. Uh, we don't get to do, it's not something we deal with them on a regular basis more than sure. we do. So my question is, let's say, how important, if, if you're in a situation like me, first of all, talk about what the chug test is, and then how important do you really believe that is to an industry like mine, where we have a transaction that goes off once every five years. All right, okay, and it's more powerful than you realize, my friend, John. <laughs> so the chug test was around that period of me looking like, you know, Don whoever out of Miami Vice and feeling very, very bad about it. And I sat down, and I remember actually getting completely wasted one night, probably my worst whiskey hangover, and I was very depressed. It re that picture really did affect me. And I thought to myself, there's a lot of people in my life I just don't like. And I thought to myself, and it was a, an off-the-cuff comment, would I, would I want them on the other side of this, this desk having a, a whiskey with me? And I thought, well, I, don't, I wouldn't want to have a whiskey with them. I wouldn't have a whiskey. And so 
it started this whole thought process and the chug test came up. So here's the example. You're walking up the street. On the other side of the street, coming the opposite way, is a client, a vendor, a partner, a friend, your wife, your boyfriend, your husband, someone in your circle. And you're on the opposite side of the road. Do you, A, turn around and pretend as though you're really interested in this uh, chair showroom and secretly look at the reflection until they've walked past? Or do you, B, run across the room, basically a them and go, John, how are you? <laughs> let's go chug a beer or let's go grab a coffee. Which one of those do you do? The answer will tell you really whether or not you want them in your life. Now, for me, I went through this with my vendors. I remember my accountant used to pee me off a lot because accountants are taught to do that. But this one was so annoying. I thought to myself, shit, I don't want to feel negative. I'm going to fire him. I fired him. I found an accountant that I could, I could relate to. Okay. Some of my best salespeople drained my energy in communicating with them. They made me a lot of money, but they annoyed the pants out of me. And whenever there was a group gathering, I, I was praying that I a, you know, a tire go wrong or something. Cause I did, I fired them and my, my income went down for maybe a month and then it started to come back up. But what came up faster was the euphoria of my group and my team and the energy we all have. And I had a few of them say, we didn't know if you were ever going to do that. <laughs> And, you know, no one ever tells you that beforehand. But yeah, it may be, now you're sitting there going, well, I only sell one penthouse every four years to this guy. I don't need to do that. Go back to the referral business. If this person is an a-hole and you do a fantastic job for them, who are they going to introduce you to? Suddenly, no, you're going to an a-hole. Of a-holes. Okay? <laughs> so if you go forward and say, look, and I'm, I'm being silly here. I'm not the most attractive realtor in Vegas, but I am the best. You know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're coming along with an edge. You're being unique to you. Don't try to be anyone else because guess what? There's no effort in being you. Okay. You say fake it till you make it. I see a lot of people that try. You're in the tech industry. You buy vans and a hoodie. You're a lawyer. <laughs> you, suddenly buy, you know, you do this. And I notice, especially in L.A., Realtors try to look a certain way, okay? Be you, you know? No one's not, no one's taking you on to date you. They're taking you on because you're an expert in that field, okay? You're not there to give them, you know, tutorial advice on how to dress. So brand yourself, take the effort of trying to be someone that you're not away and concentrate on that client and say, look, my business is purely referral. When I'm finished, I'm going to introduce. I'm going to ask you to introduce me to your circle. If you don't think I did a good job, then ignore that request. If you want more people like me in your life, then I would respect that referral. Mm -hmm. Okay, and actually position it. And I talk in the book about positioning the ask and make it impossible to misunderstand. And then you can even go back to them. I've gone to clients in the past when I've sent them on a trip or something like that, and I've gone, hey. Tell me two things you didn't like about that trip that I sent you to Florence on. And they go, uh, there was <laughs> none. It was brilliant. Great. Then introduce me to five people who you want to say the same. And they go, all right. You know, it's, yes, it's a bit of a, a, a bait and switch, but it's usually the good to go in with a negative. So when you've sold the guy to penthouse, go, look, was this something I could have done better? I'm all about improving my ability and my skill. Is there something that you wish I would have done that I didn't? Mm -hmm. And when they go, no, it was seamless. It was brilliant. Thank you. Then I'm doing my job. Well, I expect you now to tell five other people that exact same thing. And maybe you want to get something like I've got in this, this right over there in that far corner, I've got some to me travel, uh, some to me passport wallet covers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I put a little scribble in there saying, even your passport should travel in style. <laughs> so when I meet a client that I've done a lot of travel with, I give him five of these and I say, I'll pay for the postage. Give them to five people who you think would appreciate the standard that you've been treated in. Mm -hmm. And now he's going up to people going, 
have a look at this. And it literally is a travel. I can get it for you if you want, but it's a travel <laughs> wallet in a beautiful black box. You open it up. I bought them in bulk, so they're not very expensive, less than five bucks each. Okay. And you open it up. There's a little bit of handwritten scribble in there, and it's got my number on and stuff, and maybe a link to an article. And you just you give it you give it to them, and they give it to someone. No one wants to keep hold of it. It's a cool thing to pass on. So I think you know it, the number one thing I'm taking away here, right here from our chat today, besides we all feedback, feedback, and you're in, you're in. Oh, but, sorry, man. No, you're okay. I think the number one thing I'm taking away though is you always have to be unforgettable to your clients and you have to do, it's the little details of things. It's more important uh, than everything else. It's the little details. It's the personalized touches. It's the staying top of mind. I know that, you know, I love the magazines. I love the Toomey. Uh, I wish they saw it sky mall because for the, we didn't talk about it, but Steve used to grab all the sky malls off of planes when he would get off and find the weirdest stuff. I right, you tell them. Tell them yeah. So what I used to do was this was before, this was uh, only about a year ago before internet was really on planes now. And because I travel so much, and this there's one element of this you can still do. Whenever I travel anywhere, the hotel that I'm in, regardless if it's Los Angeles or um, Venice, wherever, I grab a bunch of the envelopes from that hotel and the stationery. And then when I would be on the plane coming home, I would just hand write envelopes. And on the stationery, I'd put on there, hey, John, I was in there and I've sent bar tabs <laughs> well, on the back of the bar tab, I was going, hey, John, I had four whiskeys tonight. Two of them, I was thinking of you. I'll call you when I get back. I would shove it in an envelope. When I landed back in America, I would post it to you. So you're sitting there one day, and you get this letter from Venice, and you open it up, and there's a bar tab in there. Or one of the other things I would do was Sky Mall, which was this ridiculous catalog of all the crap no one wants. And the, the start of <laughs> oh, yeah. They would have like a manatee um, uh, post box and they would have a skull arm back scratch. It was all useless stuff. I would tear it out, don't scissor it, rip the damn thing out with a silver or black marker, depending on how dark the picture was, write on it, John, surely your clients need a manatee post box for that <laughs> penthouse, and stick it in this envelope. And I would get off the plane with about 50 to 60 envelopes. And then I would you know, just post them the following day and you would get all of this stuff. And it doesn't, all it would cost me was the post. Now I still say that emails, we get hundreds to thousands a day. If you can use that tip and especially being in Vegas, you know, go down to the local and they will do this, go down to the hotel and go, hey, I'm doing some letters over there. I need some envelopes and some stationery, please. Hotels love this because it's the way of promoting that hotel. And you write the note on that and send it. When you get an envelope from a hotel, it's embossed, it's good stationery, it's cost you squat, and they open it. If it's a plain envelope with a little window box and it's got a, a type, they think it's an IRS bill and they give it to someone else. Well, I think the magic of that is, though, is – what, when you were talking about, then the guy would open the weird thing with the, the Bigfoot golf swing helper or whatever it was and go to a dinner party with all of his friends and ask his friends, hey, this guy sent me this crazy thing and said this reminded me of him. Does this – why would he send me this? But it made you a topic of conversation at dinner parties you were not even at. And I thought yeah, that I've was people, so brilliant. I've had people come up to me before literally calling me the Manate post box boy. <laughs> And I've gone, do what? And they're like, Johnny, and like Johnny owns like, you know, 25 aircraft and has been around the world with some amazing things that I've done for him. Yet the story they can remember is when this, this idiot British biker travels the planet with the rich and famous and sends me a Manatee post box. Ripped <laughs> out. I actually, um, I had a, um, a referral with someone and before the referral, um, sorry, before meeting the guy, I said, look, you know, let's get together. I found out by Googling the stuff that he was a Porsche addict, okay? So I got this magazine that was on, like, the top Porsches, and I'm sure he probably had the magazine. But in the center was a pull-out poster, okay? I carefully undid the poster, took a picture of the magazine and the poster, sent him the magazine, and I said, I'm looking forward to getting together with you next Tuesday, but if you cancel it, the calendar gets it. 
So I made this joke that I was going to shred the calendar and he wouldn't get, <laughs> he didn't give a damn. But I turned up and he actually went, oh, it's good to see you. Where's my calendar? <laughs> of course he did. So it's all about being you, being happy to be you, being transparent as to what really resonates with you. But really picking up on those little bits mm. and it's those little bits that really, that really sting. I remember, I think it was Greg Reed said that no one ever got stung by an elephant. They get stung by bees and gnats. It's the little things that sting you. Mm -hmm. No, it's great. Well, I want to talk about, obviously, the book. Uh, the book is awesome. Real, uh, realtors that are out there watching this, I know you guys don't read. So on Audible at 1.25, it's about three hours and 47 minutes to listen to in the car. But you're in all day anyway, so you might as well. Um, but yeah, talk, talk, talk a little bit about the book. I want people to go buy it. It's called The Blue Fishing. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Get it everywhere. So talk about yeah. that. So... <laughs> I don't want to sound uh, boastful, but we've always been Boast. asked to do a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've always been asked to do a book, but every single book or every TV show has been about, can you name your affluent clients? Can you talk about the celebrities? And we've always gone, no, because if we did, we'd be dead by cocktail hour. So this time, for about the past seven or eight years, I've done a lot of speaking engagements with entrepreneurs on how to brand, how to market, how to increase an ROI, how to get the right clientele, how to build your unique property. I've always talked about that. And then finally, very fortunate, I got approached by Simon Schuster, who said, would you be willing to do a how-to book that talks about some of the things you've done like with the Vatican, but then breaks it down into 12 easy steps, how you built up that relationship, how you did this, how you maximize it. So there's a cheat sheet that someone can take into their business. So it's called Blue Fishing, the art of making things happen. Because you have to make things happen. It's not called sit on your ass and it will come. These are the tidbits for you to be able to simply action, because anyone listening to this and watching this knows that I'm not complicated. I class myself as educated, but school had nothing to do with that. I'm a guy that works on my gut, not on my head. These are simple, foolproof tips that allow me to chat with Elon Musk and Richard Branson that you can take into your business. And for anyone out there going, well, you had the advantage of uh, good luck with that because I never had any of those and you don't have to either. <laughs> well, if you, I, again, highly recommend you guys go get the book. If you enjoyed Steve today, please share this video so we can get the word out about his book. It's called Blue Fishing on Amazon and everything else. I got to ask you one more question before we jump off because I want to be cognizant of your time. But what is the craziest thing you've ever been asked to get that you've gotten done? And what is the craziest thing that you have not been able to get done? I know you know, you make everything happen. So I'm dying to hear if there's one thing, the craziest thing you could not get done. So the craziest one that I really liked, and I mentioned it slightly earlier, was the client had asked, told me that he wanted to go to Florence and he wanted to go to an exclusive restaurant. And that was the, that was the whole parameter. We took over the academia, set up a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David, cleared out the entire museum and had, um, I told him I was going to get a local artist to come in for entertainment. I had um, Andrea Bocelli wander in and serenade him during the dinner. <laughs> that was the craziest one that we did because there were so many moving parts. And to be honest with you, for me, just standing in the academia at the feet of the most iconic statue in the world while the most iconic Italian speak, um, singer sings away yeah. was just, I was gobsmacked. Yeah, the one that we done. didn't do, the one that we didn't do, sadly, is easier to answer, and it's embarrassing. <laughs> because we, it wasn't a case of we didn't do it. It's because it's, one of, it's been one of the only things we refused to do. Wow, okay, got to hear this then. We had a client... Uh, contact a very affluent client. He wanted to detonate a nuclear warhead. <laughs> and he was serious. Oh. <laughs> so, serious. Uh, yeah, sadly, yes. So, and if it had been now, this was back in like 92, but if it had been now, we'd obviously be making phone calls to authorities. But at the time, <laughs> we just said, no, uh, it's not something we're, we're comfortable about doing. And he was like, I just want to push the button on the most powerful thing in the world. I was like, well, we're not going to assist you with that. So I'm telling you now, not only are we not doing it, B, we're revoking your membership. All the best. So oh, gosh. you got rid of them. But between me and you and the everybody that's watching this, how many phone calls would it have taken? <laughs> Trouble is, there's a, guy, there's a guy with a funny haircut over uh, uh, North right. 
that will right. take the money. So it yeah. is, I've learned in all my years, nothing's impossible until it's done. Right. So wow. I have well, no, I, I can, again, maybe this sounds a, a bit boasting, but I can do anything if you can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think that's a great thing to leave on. So Steve, again, man, thank you so much. You are a treasure trove of information. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next time you're in Vegas. We can uh, exercise that chug test and stop. And we listen. will. <laughs> All right, my friend. Uh, I'm going to talk to you. And guys, thanks for joining us again for Buy the Book, Blue Fishing. If you need real estate uh, here in Las Vegas, Simply Vegas Real Estate, we're happy to accommodate your needs. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.